Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this program, United States and Colombia Relations, 20 years of a strategic partnership in 200 years of friendship. My name is Lina Elgado, Executive Director of the Colombian American Association. The Colombian American Association is the first free national chamber of commerce for Colombia, established in the United States. We are a private non-for-profit business organization founded in 1927 in New York. The association mission is to create great knowledge and understanding of Colombia. We seek to disseminate up to today information on economic, financial, and political matters, and to promote commercial and cultural ties among the people of the two nations. I am pleased to welcome our panelists, Ambassador Ann Patterson, Ambassador Liliana Ayalde, and Paul Angelo, Director of the William J. Perry of Hemispheric uh, Defense Studies. This incredible program wouldn't be complete without our moderator and who put this great panel together, Andres Torres, Chief Special, uh, Special Investigation Bureau Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor of the City of New York. Thank you, Ambassador Patterson, Ambassador Ayalde, and Paul, and Andres for being uh, here today with us. I also want to thank our partners, Collaborate Up, Signox, and the New York Bar Inter-American Affairs Committee. I am delighted to welcome everyone who is virtually attending, and I hope you enjoy this event. Andres, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lena, uh, very much for the invitation uh, and for the kind words. Also want to thank the uh, members of our audience uh, who are joining us uh, tonight. Um, and uh, I also, of course, want to thank our three outstanding panelists and want to take a brief uh, moment to, to introduce them. Their full bios uh, will be in or should be in the materials that, that you may have received with the invitation. So this is just going to be a brief uh, overview. And then I'll discuss a little bit of the format of tonight's uh, discussion. And then from there, um, we will then begin with the, with the questions. So uh, Ambassador uh, Ann Patterson was Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern and North uh, African uh, Affairs at the Department of State from 2013 to 2017. She served as Ambassador to Egypt from 2011 to 2013 to Pakistan from 2007 to 2010, to Colombia from 2000 to 2003, and to El Salvador from 1997 to 2000. She retired in 2017 with rank of career ambassador after more than four decades in the Foreign Service. Ambassador Patterson also served as Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs and as Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations. Ambassador uh, Liliana Ayalde recently retired from the United States Foreign Service uh, following a distinguished 38-year career with assignments in Washington, D.C. and abroad. Amongst other key positions, uh, most recently, Ambassador Ayalde served as the civilian deputy to the commander and foreign policy advisor at the United States Southern Command in Miami until 2019. She served as U.S. Ambassador to Brazil from 2013 to 2016 and U.S. Ambassador to Paraguay from 2008 to 2011. Prior to that, Ambassador Ayalde served as US, uh, USAID Mission Director in Colombia from 2005 to 2008, uh, where she had responsibility for development of the assistance portfolio, uh, development assistance portfolio under Plan Colombia. Uh, Dr. Paul Angelo, uh, is director of the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. His previous work at the Council on Foreign Relations included roles as fellow for Latin America Studies and as an international affairs fellow. There he focused on U.S. Latin American relations, transnational crime, security assistance, and immigration. A former active duty naval officer, Dr. Angelo deployed to Colombia on three occasions, uh, over the course of more than a decade. During his longest mission in Colombia, he served as the U.S. Embassy's principal liaison to the Colombian military and police in the highly conflicted Pacific coast. Dr. Angelo uh, graduated from the, New, uh, from the U.S. Naval Academy, is a Truman Scholar, a Rhodes Scholar, and received his PhD in politics from University College London. Um, so, 
as you can see, we have really fantastic uh, panelists. Um, and I, again, thank them so much for their time. Uh, so before we begin, I just want to give a brief uh, overview of the format for tonight's conversation. I'm going to ask each panelist two questions um, and then ask them to keep their remarks to uh, within five minutes uh, or so. Uh, and I know that the, and either any one of these questions could merit its own separate individual uh, panel. Uh, I, I'm fully aware of that. Hopefully we can touch on some issues um, and then raise it, uh, open the conversation up to uh, members of the audience um, who can submit their questions uh, through the Q&A uh, function um, in writing. If you want to do so in Spanish, I'll do my best to uh, translate on the fly. I ask you to keep also uh, the questions brief, uh, as brief and as pointed as, as possible. Um, also, of course, feel free to, to send them uh, in English as uh, tonight's uh, conversation will, will be uh, in English. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to ask Ambassador uh, Patterson uh, the, first, the first question. So Ambassador Patterson, this year, uh, the United States and Colombia celebrated uh, 200 years of diplomatic relations and much has been made about the uniquely strong relationship that has existed between both countries for many years. And while though this is undoubtedly true, I think it's fair to say that relations between both countries hit a little bit of a rough patch in the mid 1990s during the administration of uh, Ernesto Sampe. And just as the bilateral relationship was struggling a little bit in the mid uh, 1990s, Colombia became the world's largest producer of cocaine and also uh, began to export uh, heroin. Uh, the vast profits from the drug trade emboldened guerrilla organizations at war with the state, paramilitaries, and other criminal organizations that caused a tremendous amount of instability to, to Colombia's institutions. So much so that uh, some analysts uh, considered Colombia at the time to be either a failed state or to be in danger of becoming uh, a failed state. You became ambassador to Colombia in the year 2000, uh, perhaps one of the most challenging and interesting uh, times to be in Colombia. Uh, and it was during that time that Colombia and US relations entered into a new transformative period uh, with Plan Colombia. So Ambassador Patterson, could you please take us back to that period and explain to us um, how Plan Colombia came about, who were the main actors that made it happen, what were the primary objectives and some of the biggest uh, challenges that you faced? And I know it's difficult to, to answer all of those in, in, in five minutes or so, but I, I appreciate I appreciate you addressing those. So, so thank you, Andres, and thanks, uh, Lena, for organizing this. And, and thank you for inviting me. I had the pleasure of speaking to this group some years ago with Luis Alberto Moreno. And, and as you mentioned, let me, let me sort of set the scene for Plan Colombia. 40% of the country was under control of the guerrillas and they had started to move into the cities. In 2000, there were 3,600 kidnappings and the impact on investment was very dramatic, probably worse than random balance because investors wouldn't come and wealthy Colombians had begun to leave the country in droves. The FARC had a practice of arresting people or arresting, grabbing people on the highways and, and shaking them down. And that had exactly the negative impact on the economy that you would anticipate. The Colombian military had suffered some really dramatic losses and some of their bases had been overrun and that became a very, uh, a, a driver for Plan Colombia, certainly in the minds of our own military. And then another issue that sort of understudy was the around called the Cano Limon pipeline. It had 170 attacks in 2000 and losses of $500 million a year. Cocoa production had quadrupled in the previous 10 years, uh, and most of the product was going to the south. And then, as you mentioned, all this uh, narcotics money was flowing into the park FARC and the paramilitaries and guerrillas. And I don't think anyone fully appreciated at the initial stages of Plan Columbia how thoroughly these groups have been infiltrated by, by the drug trade. So many people take picture, uh, take credit for it now, uh, but from our side, it was in my recollection, Tom Pickering and General Barry McCaffrey. And General McCaffrey was a four-star general who became drug czar. On the Colombian side, I gotta give a lot of credit to President Pastrana and his chief of staff, Jaime Ruiz. 
and Luis Alberto Moreno up here, who was absolutely key in maintaining political support in the US. America had become very alarmed at the increase in cocaine flowing into the US and poppy because, because heroin addiction was going up too. And what I saw uh, as this program was put together, there was excellent leadership this is not the case in some of our more recent adventures, like in Afghanistan. There was a joint process that was disciplined. It wasn't always friendly between the Americans and the Colombians. And then there was an actual plan that was arrived at jointly. I, I don't think the U.S. government could replicate such a complex program now. And as I say, it was utterly unique in my 43 years. The other thing that benefited the formulation was Dennis Hastert. And despite his more recent problems, he was steadily behind Plan Columbia and he worked hard to get the money appropriated. And then I have to give credit again to President Pastrana who worked not only to develop a very positive relationship with Bill Clinton, but he also assiduously courted members of Congress and invited every last one of them to his house and said how he needed their help. And then maybe importantly, after a controversial start, I think this is really important, Plan Columbia largely had the support of the Colombian people. Uh, maybe because the level of violence was no longer tolerable, maybe because Pastrana's experiment with the Despeje had shown the FARC wasn't interested in peace. In any case, once Uribe came along, there was a good basis to allow him to raise taxes and take any uh, other support. And as security improved, support for Plan Columbia grew. So let me talk a minute about the challenges. First, I say there was enormous tension between the Colombian police and military because one of the key objectives was to expand the size of the military. Each had their supporters in the US. There were lots of tensions on the ground between the Americans and Colombians, particularly over helicopters. Working with the Colombian military was a challenge because they saw the human rights requirements as an indictment and they weren't entirely wrong. But it was also a challenge for Marta Lucia Ramirez and I'm a great admirer uh, because she got control of their budget, and they saw her as a direct uh, threat to their independence. But this, this working level relationship got better over time. And I think it's important to remember on these anniversary dates that, that the US had been embedded in the Colombian Ministry of Defense since 1952, and Colombian uh, soldiers had fallen under General McCaffrey's father in the Korean War. Human rights was an issue, of course, and a challenge, a constant challenge, particularly the, the relationship between the paramilitaries and the military. And then from our standpoint, a major challenge was distinguishing drug trafficking from insurgency. So the results were very dramatic. There was a significant improvement in security, a massive drop in kidnappings to 213. There was a massive drop in attacks on the pipeline. Um, and then the restoration of public safety as Colombians started to bring their money back and the increase in rural security, which allowed other elements of the counter narcotics program to take place. And here's what I'll say at the end. I think what it also showed was the importance of a long-term commitment and the, the ability to work together and develop um, uh, a, a longer term relationship and a longer term strategy. And I think both the Americans and Colombians had strong leadership that put a stop to squabbling and made decisions. It also allowed the plan to evolve as it went on. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Patterson. And, you know, it is, it's, it's hard to believe how dire the situation was uh, in 2000. Um, if you if you go back, if you're going to Columbia, you know, anytime within the last five years or so, and it's just, thank you for, for reminding everybody of, of just the challenges that, 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 that the United States and Columbia were, were facing together at that time. Um, I'd like to now uh, ask uh, Ambassador Ayalde uh, uh, a question. 
Ambassador Ayalde, the, the, the easy headline uh, over the years was that Plan Columbia was a military plan and it was about helicopters and fumigation. Um, the reality, of course, is that Plan Columbia initiated one of the most far-reaching and comprehensive development programs in the world. And the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, was at the center of that. And you were uh, mission director there for, for really critical years. Uh, can you please tell us a little bit about the role of USAID uh, during Plan Columbia? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Andres. Uh, good evening to my colleagues and uh, to the audience. Thank you to to Lena and Andres for, for inviting me. As a Colombian American, I was uh, felt privileged to have served there um, a little later than, than Anne actually. And uh, so this is a great opportunity for me to share some of my insights. Um, but let me start um, a bit by uh, a bit of context in terms of USAID. Uh, Colombia is a middle income country, and so therefore it would not traditionally be a recipient of uh, development assistance. So because of all the reasons uh, that uh, Ambassador Patterson mentioned, particularly, um, you know, the fact that uh, a middle income country, the, the terminology kind of masks the severe inequities. Uh, that drove USAID into partnering um, all the the uh, the um, the conflict, uh, the victims as a result of the conflict. And this this two Colombias that that often is referred to, uh, USAID was looking at that other Colombian, those that are more remote, have not had access to basic services, uh, and certainly were um, the inequities are quite visible. Uh, so we partnered with with uh, with with Colombia, um, looking at mostly at the rural area that had been traditionally uh, neglected. By the time I got there, the um, I was um, I had the responsibility overseeing a portfolio of about 150 million dollars out of a 500 million dollar uh, package with Plan Colombia. Ours was smaller. You know, it was a kind of a three-pronged approach, uh, looking at um, uh, security, counter narcotics, and social and economic development. And over time, that proportion uh, increased. In other words, less stick to security and counter narcotics, and more has increased. Uh, I don't have the latest figure, but that's the, that amount has certainly increased. But that was what I had when I was there, uh, and it included. A, a number of activities uh, to promote economic prosperity uh, through the listed economy, uh, improving the, the livelihoods of the victims and uh, the vulnerable groups and promotion of human rights and the rule of law and some environmental work. A lot of this work, there's really the precursors uh, to programs uh, that are there and part of the institutionality of the Colombian government and a very critical pieces of the peace accords um, that we can talk about uh, later. But for instance, the work with the IDPs, uh, with the, um, uh, the in, um, internally displaced population certainly gave a lot of experience and a, a backdrop for how to manage the, the Venezuelan migrants. So there was a lot there. Now, in 2005, 2006, in the early part of my tenure, the cooperation really intensified because of the demobilization of 30,000 uh, paramilitary combatants. And USAID supported the demobilization and the reintegration of these ex-combatants. You know, everything from laying down the arms, registering them, they didn't have any documentation. Uh, they needed psychosocial assistance, healthcare, uh, education, and a very important part is reintegration to society. Um, including the child soldiers, both young girls and young boys that had been forcibly recruited that needed a special, special care. So during this time as well, we were dealing with the largest internally displaced population, which at the time was 2 million uh, people. And at the time, it was the largest IDP population in the world. This was prior to Syria. Um, but it also, a lot of work on similar things of you know, housing, uh, education, and and certainly training and reinsertion into uh, into uh, reintegration into into society. Like with the ex-combatants, 
uh, and the IDP, USAID partner very closely with the private sector to look at, you know, all sorts of creative different ways of, of re-engaging, re uh, reinserting the, 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 these, uh, these groups. Um, I remember very clearly our partnership with Asoco Flores. Uh, and how the, the, the flower industry um, included a number of the women um, and trained them into picking and packing flowers for export, a very successful partnership, partnership with the private sector. But a lot of work was also done with victims, uh, victims in the rural areas, Afro-Columbian uh, um, communities, as well as the indigenous. Um, and uh, very clearly remember a very, a very um, a powerful program with a scholarship program with indigenous as well as Afro-Columbians. Uh, worked it together with uh, Luis Gilberto Murillo, as a matter of fact, who is now uh, the, uh, has been nominated to be ambassador to, to the Petro's uh, ambassador to, to, to uh, Washington. So, um, so a lot, again, a lot of the work there with the, with the ethnic communities were cre precursors and, and were laid out the groundwork for, for a lot of uh, progress that, that, that was made. Not enough, obviously, but a lot of, of work was there, particularly in, in generating leadership spaces uh, uh, with some of the Afro-Columbian um, leaders as, um, as well. Uh, but the bulk of the resources went to alternative development and looking at alternatives to, to look the licit uh, to COCA, uh, providing farmers, uh, small farmers with the tools and the technology, the, the uh, training uh, to make their, their, their business more viable, and uh, some sm small um, land titling efforts. Uh, it, it was looking for illicit alternatives to COCA. Uh, we worked uh, also in, in the high conflict zones uh, like La Macarena. And this was a shift in policy going straight into, you know, the heart of FARC and seeing how it was to working with these communities uh, and build trust and the need to bring a program that if you're familiar with AID, uh, OTI, which works at generating the trust with communities quickly uh, while security is, is consolidated and other public services can come in. And that became a model that then has evolved over the time. So, you know, everything from human rights, we had the largest human rights program in the world. It had to do with uh, human rights protection, of course, as well as promotion and, um, and, a, and, and a number of these uh, of, of access to justice programs. But, but what I'd like to share, and I'll end with this, is more on sort of what I took away as lessons learned. And I won't, I could go into details on each of them, but I'll just mention them um, briefly. Security, um, it's not only needed for an effective development program uh, and for it to work, but it's a prerequisite for development. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, um, you can't expect the private sector to go into a region if you don't have the basic level of security. Uh, so security is, is critical uh, if you really want to have sustainable and consolidated development. The other uh, is integrated rural development. We did a lot of work, but I think it became quite clear that you just couldn't go in and help the farmers uh, become from, you know, switch from a coca to, to a cacao producer. They need, it needed to be an integrated development. You needed to have other services that were provided hand in hand with the, uh, with the, with the um, economics of it. Then the whole of government approach, which I prefer to call whole of society, uh, that it's not a commitment only by the government or the donor or civil society. It has to be the private sector, everybody that goes in and if there's a commitment to really make it work if you want to make it sustainable or else it just it will uh, it would it will not it would not last um yeah. and then see is synchronization and uh, sequencing it's important to, to to really think about these things strategically uh what goes in because you build trust and then there's nothing and then you drop it and then you lose it so you've got to you know think about that conscientiously Interagency coordination and communication sounds easy, uh, but this is really a challenge. It's not only true, it was a challenge not only for us at the embassy, at, at, you know, with the US government, but with the Columbians. Um, and I have to highlight a, a mechanism that really worked, which was Acción Social, which was at the presidential level, 
everybody sat down together. We rolled up our sleeves. We managed the data. We pulled it together. We talked about troubleshooting, sequencing, and strategies. And it just it just worked. It worked. Um, you know, sometimes politics don't let it work long enough. But uh, but it it certainly was an experience that that I came away with um, very positively. And then regionalization. Um, that you know things are different, and Colombia has different Colombias. You know you can't do the same thing in the Atlantic coast that you do in the Pacific coast. Even though they're both coasts, they're very different, and so uh, the need to do that uh, is is critical. And then consistency and continuity. Um, you know sometimes I guess I also already mentioned it a little bit. You know politics gets in the way, but development is a long term effort. You know, there's some things that can be done short term and medium term, but most of it, if you do it for a long, you know, if you want it to be consolidated and sustainable, it needs to be consistent and over time. Those are generally the lessons learned for me. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Ayalde. And it really is just remarkable the, the impact that, that USAID had in Colombia continues to have and, and how it's been sustained for, for such a long time now. Uh, so thank you so much for, for, those, for those remarks. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, our, my next question is for Dr. Angelo. Um, Dr. Angelo, uh, as we've discussed and as we've seen, few democracies have had to confront such a sustained such sustained national security threats uh, as Colombia. Uh, can you describe how Colombia and the United States partnered throughout the last two decades or uh, to jointly confront uh, the threats to, to national security that both uh, countries faced as a result of all of the, the activities and kind of the situation that, 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 that was happening in Colombia and that's been described. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, and to, to Lena for the invitation. I'm really thrilled and flattered to be on this panel with two pe other panelists that I so admire and people who provided really incredible source material for an upcoming book that I have on Plan Colombia and the Merida Initiative, which will be coming out next year. Um, and in that book, really what I sort of discuss in my initial description of the us Colombia National Security Partnership uh, is that it's a partnership that is curious and perhaps even unlikely. Um, because if you all recall, in, in the early 20th century, the United States government supported the secession of Panama from the, the national territory of Colombia. Um, but three decades later, the Colombian government was inviting at a very granular level, US naval advisors into Colombia to establish a, the first ever US naval mission at uh, a US embassy post in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the expressed intent of that invitation was to help protect the approaches to the Panama Canal, the southern approaches to the Panama Canal. Uh, and so I find it actually quite curious that uh, the national security relationship between Colombia and the United States has flourished and, and has done so uh, for so long. Uh, and, and as Ambassador Patterson mentioned, uh, participation in the, the Korean conflict, uh, the introduction of um, Plan Lasso, which was sort of a counterinsurgency strategy, and, and again, a, sort of an initial iteration of winning hearts and minds and a whole of government approach implemented by the United States military. and. The, the Colombian uh, government in the 1960s, something that endured uh, uh, into the early 1970s. Uh, and then we saw sort of a renegotiation of that partnership in the 1980s as the drug war took center stage. Uh, but Plan Colombia was really the opportunity for the US government to turbocharge its national security relationship uh, with Colombia. And it's because as Ambassador Patterson noted, uh, we had a willing partner uh, in the Pastrana administration and, and a partner that also had, had a mandate uh, from the Colombian people uh, to do two things. One, to negotiate peace. Um, and that was very clear on the other side of the Samper administration, and particularly given the very damaging attacks uh, and, and assaults that were taking place um, uh, at US, uh, excuse me, at Colombian military bases or police installations throughout the national territory in the late 1990s, that a, a negotiated solution was seen as uh, the, the, the salida or the way out of the, the armed conflict. Uh, but secondarily, the Pastrana government had a mandate from the Colombian people uh, to reinvigorate uh, the um, or, or modernize and improve uh, the equipment and the capability of the Colombian Fuerza Pública, the police and, and the military. Unfortunately, because of the dynamics of the peace negotiations in El Cahuan, uh, the, the Pastrana government uh, didn't really communicate a positive vision for what the Colombian military should necessarily be doing 
on the alongside or on the sidelines of uh, of the, um, the the peace negotiations. However, when the peace negotiations collapsed in 2002, the Pakistan administration uh, basically uh, within 24 hours uh, ordered the military to go back and retake the the Dispehe from the FARC, uh, and which commenced a period of sort of frontal uh, confrontation with the, the the FARC and other guerrilla groups uh, that at the time were were had taken. Um, a, a real hold in, in the Colombian countryside in particular. Uh, and, and then you had at the end of, in the second half of 2002, the arrival of President Uribe. And President Uribe benefited uh, from a couple of really unique conditions that helped uh, the United States government broaden its, its, its relationship with Colombia on the national security front. The first thing was because of the failure of the El Caguan peace process, um, there was a real inter-party consensus in Colombia and in, within the Colombian Congress and amongst the Colombian people that uh, the FARC were not negotiating in, in good faith and that the public tenor was such that a militarized approach to ending the conflict was the only acceptable solution. Uh, that also coincided in 2001 with the, the, the terrorist attacks uh, of 9-11 in the United States uh, and the declaration of a global war on terror, which allowed for expanded authorities for the, the United States government to link Colombia's own experience with terrorism to a broader campaign to root out terrorism and the illicit sources of financing for terrorists across the world. And so uh, all of a sudden, Colombia became uh, the center stage for the global war on terror in Latin America and the Caribbean from the US perspective. Plan Colombia as well, uh, with these expanded authorities on the other side of September 11th, also allowed for uh, the Colombian government to push its own defense expenditures up above 3% of GDP, which had up to that point been unheard of. And that facilitated uh, two major capabilities that the Colombian government had long lacked, uh, but that are essential in fighting a counterinsurgency or engaging in counterterrorism. One is access to time sensitive or time critical information. Uh, and so expanding on the intelligence capabilities of, of the Colombian military at this juncture was incredibly important. And two, an ability to act on that information, which meant mobility. And as Ambassador Patterson mentioned, it was the delivery of, of helicopters uh, to get Colombian troops uh, to the hinterlands or the, the sort of the geographic periphery of the national territory where guerrilla groups and drug trafficking organizations and paramilitaries thrived. Uh, and then as, as both of the other panelists mentioned, uh, this was supported in large part, not just by, um, you know, the, uh, the other entities within the, gov the Colombian government or other parties in Congress, uh, but also by the Colombian people and something that was uh, of particular interest to the Colombian private sector. And this is something that I go sort of explore deeply in, in, in my book, but it, the, the democratic security tax gave the private sector a stake in the design and the implementation of Colombia's security strategy. There were consistent consultations between the executive branch, uh, which allowed the Colombian private sector to exert a degree of oversight. Um, and and that, that's a, a really unique formulation that we haven't seen replicated in many other places in Latin America. A couple of uh, instances of it at the subnational level, sort of the municipal or state level in, um, in Mexico over the past decade. Uh, but I really do think that it, it allowed the Colombian government to corral a whole society consensus on how to deal with uh, the national security quagmire. Um, and and it, it sort of pinnacled at the time when I was in Colombia uh, in the sort of the, the latter part of uh, the, the first decade of this century um, under something known as the Colombian Strategic Development Initiative. And this was the whole of government or uh, interagency approach on the US side of how the United States was going to plug in some 23 executive agencies or departments from the US government to support our equivalent partners on the, on the Colombian side. Um, and, and as Ambassador Ayalde uh, mentioned, Acción Social, Acción Integral, which you know, was the Colombian government's uh, whole of society or whole of government approach uh, was complementary to the, the organization that we had achieved on, in, in the United States. Um, and, and it's, as Ambassador Patterson mentioned, something that we haven't necessarily been able to replicate uh, in similar contexts. Um, be it Afghanistan or Iraq um, or other top national security priority countries. Um, and so Colombia was, was, was really unique uh, in, in so many ways, uh, but it was undergirded by, uh, you know, a real sense, a national consensus in Colombia um, that was reflected in, in the Oribe, uh, first the Pastrana administration, then the Oribe administration's broader uh, political vision and security strategy for the country. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Angela, for that very complete uh, overview uh, of the of how, the, how both countries have, have worked together for for such a long time and worked very well, very effectively. 
Uh, we're a little bit past halfway through, and I'm going to start now my uh, second round of questions. And I'd like to um, uh, turn back to Ambassador Patterson. Um, and as, as we've as we've discussed, um, you know, there were many components to Plan Columbia, but perhaps none received uh, as much attention as the aerial fumigation policy. Could you uh, explain why that decision was made to conduct aerial uh, eradication and some of the challenges in implementing uh, that policy? Yes, thanks, Andres. It was, uh, there, there were lots of elements of Plan Columbia that was a success, but this was by far the most controversial. Um, and, and it was basically because of the enormous acreage, 400,000 acres, 162,000 acres under, under cultivation that we knew about. And our estimate at the time was that there were a lot more out there that we did not know about that wasn't counting. That became better over time. Uh, but the decision was made to spray it with glyphosate because there's no question that that eradicates coca. It's become very controversial whether it works, but it does work and it works quickly. And almost half the crop was eliminated in the first few, uh, three years. It went up again in 2007, but they were still way down from the beginning of Plan Kanoli. But, but importantly, and this I think is very key, it began to take revenue out of the hands of the FARC and the Paras and other criminal gangs who were levying taxes on these growers. Let me stress what Liliana said, none of this works security. No, no, no it's going to switch crops. Uh, unless he has security, uh, because otherwise he's uh, extorted and intimidated by these criminal gangs. I wanna make a couple other points. And one is the safety of glyphosate. I am still skeptical of these more recent claims that it's uh, carcinogenic. They're very controversial, but I know as a practical matter with these lawsuits against Bayer uh, and the $11 billion in claims that, it, that as a practical matter, aerial eradication is essentially off the table uh, for this foreseeable future. The Biden administration is not going to force any Colombian government to resume spring. And with the new government, I would suspect it's off the table for good. The, the real question is, what is the link between availability of coca in the field and lawlessness in Colombia and addiction in the US? And, and the belief in the US, the strong belief is that consumption in the US fell as a result of eradication from Colombia. Uh, and from what I can tell, cultivation soared after the peace agreement. It's at record levels now, comparable to the beginning of Plan Colombia. Manual eradication has had some effect, um, but now, DEA and others say that the increase in overdoses, which have gone up again, uh, is largely available, is largely due to the availability of record levels of cocaine and cocoa cultivation in, in Colombia. We don't have time to sort of talk about the balloon effect, and that's certainly a factor. Uh, the sort of moral argument that people make that peasants can't be deprived of income until we give them another guaranteed income and then ultimately, many foreign countries, including Colombians, think this is a demand problem and it has to be solved in the consuming countries and that the producing countries shouldn't uh, wear the, the, the bulk of it. Um, my own view is that manual eradication can work. I saw it work in Pakistan at a much higher cost in violence and coercive measures. But Colombia will still need to attract attack drugs at all points in the system, including in the field. Um, for the US, let's be honest, drugs are a public health and crime problem, but the risk for Colombia of an integrated drug industry returning are a lot more severe. Uh, so maybe I can stop there and we can come back to some of that uh, during the question. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, for, for sharing those those thoughts. Um, I'm going to now ask uh, next question for Ambassador Ayalde. And uh, also just to remind folks, we're starting to get some questions in the Q&A. So if, if you think of questions as the panelists are speaking, please, again, please write concise questions uh, in the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as we can. 
Uh, Ambassador Ayalde, um, 16 years after the beginning of Plan Colombia, the almost unthinkable occurred, and that was Colombia reached a historic peace agreement with the FARC, one of the most powerful, violent uh, guerrilla organizations, really, certainly in the history of, of Latin America, and, and, and the most certainly one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, uh, guerrilla organization in Colombia. Can you describe uh, USAID's role in supporting uh, the Colombian peace process? Uh, certainly. Well, I guess I could start by saying that when the historic peace uh, agreement was signed in 2016, we were already working in a number of the, uh, uh, of directly in the number of areas that are part of the agreement. So it's, again, sort of precursor um, uh, aspects um, related to uh, victims uh, uh, and sustainable and, and inclusive peace, you know, which today is being called pas total, I guess. If, um, if you go to the agreement itself, and I will quickly just read the six chapters because it's, it, it, it flows right from the conversation I had earlier uh, with different titles maybe, but you know, it's the first one is comprehensive rural reform, uh, a democratic opportunity to build peace, end of conflict, solution to the illicit drug problem, agreement regarding victims of conflict, uh, the comprehensive system of truth, uh, justice and reparations, um, and the JEP implementation and uh, verification and public uh, endorsement. So the, the USAID portfolio was closely aligned with the, uh, with the key aspects of, of the accords. Um, of course, all of this, you know, whatever USAID has in their portfolio, these are negotiations with the government at the time. So it's driven by the policies of the Colombian government, driven by the policies and priorities. So obviously, it, 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 uh, it let's say it, it, it got adapted a bit. But if you look at it, um, the central focus of the USAID program has always been with, with victims of the conflict however you want to describe it, you know, whether they were IDPs or whether there were, um, you know, the um, Afro-Colombian or indigenous communities and so forth. The peace accords itself uh, identified 9 million victims of the conflict, of which 85% uh, were victims because of displacement. So the majority were IDPs. And that means that all the work that we had done with the original 2 million, are were really lessons learned and precursors and platforms or whatever can be done in you know these uh, eighty six percent of the nine million um, uh, uh, under the peace accords and um, in addition the peace accords created new entities two of which um, specifically la comisión de la verdad the truth commission and the unidad de búsqueda uh, the personas, I guess it's unit for the search of missing persons. Um, they didn't exist. The third is the Je the Jeb, uh, the the, um, the uh, that's more like the special uh, jurisdiction tribunal. Um, and two of them that uh, well, at least with two of them, uh, it received a substantial, significant amount of support from USAID because they didn't exist. So the protocols had to be uh, set in place, uh, the systems, uh, uh, streamlining of bureaucracies and, and, and people trained and so forth. So um, there was, a, as, as these organizations had to quickly examine the various dimensions of the, of the conflict and the, the victims, because there are different types of cases, systems and procedures needed to be created. And USAID helped with that. Um, but just to give you a sense of the magnitude, the Truth Commission recently published their, their report and recommendations, I guess about maybe about a month or two months ago. Um, uh, it entailed collecting and listening to 20,000 testimonies from victims. Uh, and, and then, you know, documenting that and, and uh, automating that. Uh, the work is massive. It also included uh, identifying mass graves. And of course, that requires uh, a particular type of expertise. USAID also partnered with a number of organizations that provided support to the forced displacement victims so they could navigate the process. People had to learn how to use it 
both the public servants that actually manage this, as well as the victims that have to go through the process. But in addition, there are also cross-sectional uh, issues like women and gender. Um, uh, USAID uh, last year launched a $30 million program on gender and issues that related to gender-based violence and so forth, which are throughout the agreement, as well as another program that is $60 million uh, working with ethnic communities, Afro-Colombian and, and indigenous communities called, uh, uh, called ethnic, ethnic communities. Uh, um, and that's the title of the project and, and is quite substantial. But again, the biggest part is with the rural integrated development. And that is, um, you know, uh, to, to promote illicit economy. And for that, you know, you have, Colombia has economy with, uh, which is quite informal, particularly in the rural areas, and then lacks um, um, judicial transparency or seguridad jurídica. And in order to make investments in, in land, you need the transparency of titles and land tenure is very important. So that, that was a core of the, the conflict and of the implementation of the peace accords. Um, and it is also an area of focus for USAID. But the reason why this is important, because I think this is the key thing, um, as people get transparency to their title, uh, they're more likely to invest in it, and they're less likely to go back to re replanting illegal crops. And the data demonstrates it, that, uh, it, you know, the recidivism uh, rates for illegal crop production drops dramatically to only 25% with land titles compared to 75% with unclear uh, uh, titles. So, uh, land titling has become a big part of what USAID is supporting. It is a very tedious process. Um, 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 there are a lot of landmines. Um, there's a lot of topography examination that needs to happen. There's a lot of procedures, legal procedures, um, but the commitment is there um, to uh, to uh, try to to clean up uh, or uh, you know, the land titles for small and medium-sized rural properties in order to strengthen the productivity, the legal productivity um, in, in the rural areas particularly. Um, uh, so there is a series of, of ways in, in which USAID has been enabling uh, the implementation of the accords. So I'll just wrap it up with that. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Ayalde. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. I have one more question for Dr. Angelo. We're getting some great questions in the Q&A. So uh, hopefully um, we can, uh, we'll be able to, to, to hopefully get to at least one or two. Um, so Dr. Angelo, 20 years after Columbia was in danger of becoming a failed state, the AUC and the FARC have been uh, largely demobilized. Kidnappings, massacres, murders are, are plummeted, although violence still continues to be a problem. Um, Colombia and the United States entered into a free trade agreement. And uh, one of the questions uh, from the audience is, is geared towards that. So we'll get to that uh, afterwards. Um, and the economy has grown significantly, although it has contracted, uh, especially during COVID. Um, and Colombia has obtained status as a major non-NATO ally, and many dangerous criminals uh, have been extradited uh, from Colombia, some of the world's most dangerous violent criminals, um, and are serving hefty uh, uh, jail sentences uh, in, in the United States for their crimes. So where, where do we go from here in terms of the national uh, security relationship? Is, is mission accomplished, or, or where do you see things things going uh, forward. Uh, this is a, a really, really uh, challenging question uh, to answer right now because it, it, it remains to be seen what the nature of uh, the US government's relationship with the Petro administration will be. Uh, we're just a couple of days into the new administration, but I do think um, that the, uh, the U.S. policy has always been uh, to constructively work with the Colombian government, regardless of who uh, is in is sitting in the Casa Nariño, uh, and to align our priorities uh, and interests with those of, of the sitting president. As the President Biden said on numerous occasions, uh, and especially 
uh, in the declaration of Colombia as the major non-NATO ally of the United States, Colombia is uh, understood to be the cornerstone of the United States in terms of its engagement with Latin America and the Caribbean. We've, continu we've uh, historically over the past 10 years in particular, uh, leveraged our relationship with Colum security relationship with Colombian institutions uh, to foster south-to-south uh, -south cooperation. So that means the U.S. government has facilitated opportunities for Colombian institutions, be they just institutions, the police, um, or uh, special forces to go to other countries in Latin America and some places, uh, even in uh, the Middle East and, and South Asia, uh, to be exporters of the knowledge that was that was obtained during the, the years of Plan Colombia. And I, I don't see uh, that necessarily uh, going away anytime soon. Um, likewise, I think the Petro and Biden administrations will find common cause on peace implementation as uh, Ambassador Ayalde uh, just sort of detailed. Uh, President Biden as vice president um, visited Colombia numerous times uh, and, and, and we, under the Obama administration helped orchestrate uh, the, the support uh, initiative uh, launched in 2015, 2016 called Peace Colombia. Uh, and so peace implementation is going to figure high on the US agenda uh, going forward. Likewise, I, I think the issues of human rights, anti-corruption, environmental, environmental protection, combating climate change, these are all strategic priorities uh, where the Biden administration and the Petro administration will find common cause. Uh, some ongoing challenges uh, that, that uh, I think, as you mentioned, Andres, we can expect. Firstly, uh, in the wake of the FARC peace accord, uh, and it, this is you know, a, a political lapse more than, more than anything else, uh, the Colombian security forces were not, um, did not fill the geographic vacuum or void that was left as the FARC retreated and demobilized. And that was a, 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 an, an error. Uh, that allowed other illegal armed groups, particularly the ELN, uh, to fill that gap and, and to, to um, secure or seize its own, its own control over valuable drug routes or um, areas of, of drug crop cultivation. Uh, and as a consequence, we've seen uh, a ballooning of the size of the uh, ELN's um, uh, force uh, composition in, in the years since the FARC uh, uh, demobilization. And so I think uh, that remains, uh, uh, you know, a, a really contentious issue and a huge challenge for, for the Petro administration going forward uh, on the security front. Likewise, organized crime activity hasn't, outside of the activities of the ELN, hasn't desisted. We have the Venezuelan migration crisis, which continues unabated, uh, economic underperformance and unemployment in Colombia, which has led to significant social unrest and mobilization in the country in recent years. Uh, there is a high expectation that Petro is going to resolve these issues right off the bat, uh, particularly given his progressive or even revolutionary base. Um, but I, I feel like he's going to be significantly constrained. Uh, and there may be some disappointment that leads to additional popular mobilization in the months or years to come. Um, and then, you know, Finally, I, I think you know the the issue that you know we haven't really touched on because it hasn't necessarily been center stage in Colombia is the growing presence of China, a near peer competitor for the United States in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, excuse me, sorry. Um, and you know, I, I think that the U.S. government position on on China's growing interest or investment in Latin America and the Caribbean is a is a very shrewd one uh, that. You know, it, it's it's only in the best interest of, of of the countries of the hemisphere to diversify their trading partners and to double down on commercial ties with with other um, nations that can that can improve the economic prospects and the prosperity uh, of places like Colombia, particularly because Colombia is a Pacific nation and should have robust relations with um, with uh, Asian countries. However. Um, you know, I think there's there's consensus across the board be in the United States or or in Latin America and the Caribbean, and particularly amongst uh, electorates throughout the region, and, and especially in Colombia, um, that, uh, that that Colombians want a, a China that is respectful of local laws and interests to include human rights, uh, labor protections, and of course the preservation of the environment. Uh, and so these are areas where I think uh, we can see that um, you know the common cause that I mentioned between the Biden administration and the Petro administration. Uh, will continue to 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 inform uh, the uh, the strong partnership that the U.S. and Colombia have traditionally enjoyed. Thank you so much, Dr. Angelo. Lots of lots of challenges uh, ahead still. Clearly, um, 
Ambassador Patterson, um, there, and we only have, unfortunately, about four minutes left. Um, but there's there's a question um, just on the on the kind of on the business development side, uh, the free trade agreement, and and kind of what what are the plans or what are the challenges facing in terms of financial in in the in the global uh, commercial space? Um, if, if there's anything, I saw that you were you were typing an answer. I don't know if there's something that you would, uh, if you have any opinions on that or any of the panelists. Oh, I, I just wanted to say that I think that's a really important question. And Petro has said that he's going to renegotiate the, the, the free trade agreement. We'll see how that goes. Certainly other countries have done that inherently. There's nothing wrong with that to modernize it, but, it, but I think it's going to be a challenge. Uh, that's a super important question, particularly about near shoring and bringing some of this back from China. Unless the other panelists can say otherwise, I've really seen little evidence that that's happening. Uh, and, and my own judgment, again, if the other panelists may disagree, is I think the administration, for all its anti-China rhetoric, has had a hard time implementing this into practical issues and is totally consumed with other issues like Ukraine and Taiwan. So I would urge our members uh, to get engaged on that through business associations and the like, because I think it's a hugely important issue that hasn't gotten enough attention. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're we're Ambassador Patterson. We're now basically at uh, at the end of our of our hour here, um, and I just want to say to each of our panelists, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. Uh, to speak to us tonight. And also, thank you so much for everything you've done to strengthen relations between uh, the United States and Colombia. Each one of you have made really invaluable uh, contributions. And, and just from the bottom of my heart, want to say thank you to each of you for everything that you've done. Um, so with that, I think I'm now going to turn it over to Lena, uh, if, that's, if that's correct. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. You say everything. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Patterson, Ambassador Yalde, and Paul for, for this great conversation. Thank you, Andres, again, for put everything together. It was an honor as a Colombian, as a director of the Colombian American Association to have these great panelists today. I, I also want to thank all uh, uh, the hardworking association team, Linda Calvet and Larry Dominguez. Thank you all for participating. I hope you can join us on our next program. And thank you, thank you again.